This is Mr. B reads J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and we're going to start with the incredible work of The Fellowship of the Ring, arguably one of the best books ever written. This um, story series is aimed at our older children in years 4, 5 and 6 and we're going to enjoy listening with it uh, to the incredible uh, soundtrack from the films, uh, the music of Howard Shaw. So sit back and enjoy the wonderful uh, work and music of Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring, Chapter 10, Strider. Frodo, Pippin and Sam made their way back to the parlour. There was no light, Mary was not there and the fire had burned low. It was not until they puffed up the embers into a blaze and thrown on a couple of faggots that they discovered Strider had come with them. There he was, calmly sitting in a chair by the door. Hello, said Pippin. Who are you and what do you want? I am called Strider, he answered quickly. And though he may have forgotten it, your friend promised to have a quiet talk with me. You said I might hear something to my advantage, I believe, said Frodo. What have you to say? Several things, answered Strider. But of course I have my price. What do you mean? asked Frodo sharply. He suspected now that he had fallen in with a rascal, and he thought uncomfortably that he had only brought a little money with him. No more than you can afford, answered Strider, with a slow smile, as if he guessed Frodo's thoughts. Just this, you must take me along with you, until I wish to leave you. Oh, indeed, replied Frodo, surprised, but not much relieved. Even if I wanted another companion, I should not agree to any such thing until I knew a good deal more about you and your business. Excellent, exclaimed Strider, crossing his legs and sitting back comfortably. You seem to be coming to your senses again. That is all to the good. You have been much too careless so far. Very well, I will tell you what I know and leave the reward to you. You may be glad to grant it when you have heard me. Go on then, said Frodo. What do you know? I have quick ears, he went on, lowering his voice, and though I cannot disappear, I have hunted many wild and wary things, and I can usually avoid being seen if I wish. Now I was behind the hedge this evening on the road, west of Bree, when four hobbits came out of the downlands. I need not repeat all that they said to each other, but one thing interested me. Please remember, said one of them, that the name Baggins must not be mentioned. I am Mr Underhill, if any name must be given. That interested me so much that I followed them here. I slipped over the gate just behind them. Maybe Mr Baggins has an honest reason for leaving his name behind, I thought, but if so, I should advise him and his friends to be more careful. I don't see what interest my name has for anyone in Bree, said Frodo angrily, and I still have to learn why it interests you, Mr Strider. You may have an honest reason for spying and eavesdropping, but if so, I should like to know it now. Well answered, said Strider, laughing, but the explanation is simple. I was looking for a hobbit called Frodo Baggins. I wanted to find him quickly. I had learned that he was carrying out of the Shire, well, a secret that concerned me and my friends. Watch every shadow, he said in a low voice. Black horsemen have passed through Bree. There was a silence. At last Frodo spoke to Pippin and Sam. I ought to have guessed it from the way the gatekeeper greeted us, he said, and the landlord seems to have heard something. Why did he press us to join the company? And why on earth did we behave so foolishly? We ought to have stayed quiet in here. It would have been better, said Strider, but I hope we will get to know one another better. When we do, I hope you will explain what happened at the end of your song, for that little prank. It was sheer accident, interrupted Frodo. I wonder, said Strider. Accident, then. That accident has made your position dangerous. Hardly more than it was already, said Frodo. I knew these horsemen were pursuing me, but now at any rate they seem to have missed me and to have gone away. You must not count on that, said Strider sharply. They will return, and more are coming. There are others. I know their number. I know these riders. He paused, and his eyes were cold and hard, and there are some folk in Bree who are not to be trusted, he went on. Bill Fernie, for instance. He has an evil name in the Bree land, and queer folk call it his house. You must have noticed him among the company, a swarthy, sneering fellow. He was very close with one of the southern strangers, and they slipped out just after your accident. Not all of these southerners mean well, and as for Fernie, he would sell anything to anybody, or make mischief for amusement even. What will Fernie sell, and what has my accident got to do with him, said Frodo, still determined not to understand Strider's hints. News of you, of course, answered Strider. An accident of your performance would be very interesting to certain people. After that, they would hardly need to know your real name. It seems to me too likely that they will hear of it before this night is over. Is that enough? You can do as you like with my reward. Take me as a guide or not. You will have to leave the open road after tonight, for the horsemen will watch it day and night. You may escape from Bree and be allowed to go forward while the sun is up, but you won't get far. They will come on you in the wild in some dark place where there is no help. Do you wish them to find you? They are terrible. The hobbits looked at him and saw with surprise that his face was drawn as if with pain, and his hands clenched the arms of his chair. The room was very quiet and still, and the light seemed to have grown dim. 
There, he cried after a moment, drawing his hand across his brow. Perhaps I know more about these pursuers than you do. You fear them, but you do not fear them enough yet. Tomorrow, you will have to escape if you can. Strider can take you by paths that are seldom trodden. Will you have him? There was a heavy silence. Frodo made no answer. His mind was confused with doubt and fear. Sam frowned and looked at his master. With your leave, Mr. Frodo, I'd say no. This Strider here, he warns and he says take care. And I say yes to that. And let's begin with him. He comes out of the wild and I never heard no good of such folk. He knows something, that's plain, and more than I like. But it's no reason why we should let him go leading us out into some dark place far from help, as he puts it. Strider did not reply to Sam, but turned his eyes keenly on Frodo. Frodo caught his glance and looked away. No, he said slowly, I don't agree. I think, I think you are not really as you choose to look. You began to talk to me like the Bree folk, but your voice has changed. Still, Sam's right in this. I don't see why you should warn us to take care, and yet ask us to take you on trust. The lesson in caution has been well learned, said Strider with a grim smile. But caution is one thing, and wavering is another. You will never get to Rivendell now on your own, and to trust me is your only chance. You must make up your mind. I will answer some of your questions, if that will help you do so. At that moment, there came a knock on the door. Mr. Butterbur had arrived with candles, and behind him was Nob with cans of hot water. Strider withdrew into a dark corner. I've come to bid you good night, said the landlord, putting the candles on the table. Nob, take the water to the rooms. He came in and shut the door. It's like this, he began hesitating and looking troubled. If I've done any harm, I'm sorry indeed. But one thing drives out another, as you'll admit, and I'm a busy man. You see, I was asked to look out for hobbits of the Shire, and for one by the name of Baggins in particular. And what has that got to do with me, asked Frodo. Ah, well, you know best, said the landlord knowingly. I won't give you away, but I was told that this Baggins would be going by the name of Underhill, and I was given a description that fits you well enough, if I may say so. Indeed, let's have it then, said Frodo, and wisely interrupting. Well, um, a stout little fellow with red cheeks, said Mr. Butterbur, solemnly. Pippin chuckled, but Sam looked indignant. That won't help you much, it goes to most hobbits, Barley. Begging your pardon, but he said it, not me. He said it, and who was that, said Frodo eagerly. Ah, well, that was Gandalf, if you know who I mean. A wizard, they say he is, but he's a good friend of mine, whether or no. But now I don't know what he'll have to say to me. If I see him again, turn all my ale sour or me into a block of wood, I shouldn't wonder. He's a bit hasty sometimes. Still, what's done can't be undone. Well, what have you done, said Frodo, getting impatient with the slow unravelling of Butterbur's thoughts. Where was I, said the landlord, pausing and snapping his fingers. Ah, oh, yes, old Gandalf. Three months back, he walked right into my room without a knock. Barley, he says, I'm off in the morning. Will you do something for me? You've only to name it, says I. I'm in a hurry, said he, and I've no time myself, but I want a message took to the Shire. Have you anyone you can send and trust to go? I can find someone, I said. Tomorrow, maybe, or the day after. Make it tomorrow, he says. And then he gave me a letter. It's addressed plain enough, said Mr. Butterbur, producing a letter from his pocket. A letter for me from Gandalf, cried Frodo. Ah, said Mr. Butterbur, then your right name is Baggins. It is, said Frodo, and you had better give me that letter at once and explain why you never sent it. That's what you came to tell me, I suppose, though you've taken a long time to come to the point. Poor Mr. Butterbur looked troubled. You're right, Master, he said, and I beg your pardon. And I'm mortal afraid of what Gandalf will say if harm comes of it. But I didn't keep it back a purpose. I put it by somewhere safe. Then I couldn't find nobody willing to go to the Shire the next day, nor the day after that. And none of my folk were to spare. And then one thing after another drove it completely out of my mind. I'm a busy man. I'll do what I can to set matters right. And if there's any help I can give, you've only to name it. Leaving the letter aside, I promised Gandalf no less. Barley, he says to me, this friend of mine from the Shire. He may be coming out this way before long, him and another. He'll be calling himself Underhill. Mind that, but you need ask no questions. And if I'm not with him, he may be in trouble. And he may need help. Do whatever you can for him, and I'll be grateful, he says. And here you are, and trouble is not far off, seemingly. What do you mean, asked Frodo? These black men, said the landlord, lowering his voice. They're looking for baggins, and if they mean well, then I'm a hobbit. It was on Monday, and all the dogs were yammering and the geese screaming. Uncanny, I called it. Nobby came and told me that two black men were at the door asking for a hobbit called Baggins. Nob's hair was all stood on end. I bid the fellows to be off and slammed the door on them. But they've been asking the same question all the way to Atchit, I hear. And that ranger Strider, he's been asking questions too. Tried to get in here to see you earlier, he did, before you'd had a bite or sup. He did, said Strider, suddenly coming forward into the light. And much trouble would have been saved if you had let him in, Barleyman. The landlord jumped up in surprise. You, he cried, you're always popping up. What do you want now? He's here with my leave, said Frodo. He came to offer me his help. Well, you know your own business, maybe, said Mr. Butterbur, looking suspiciously at Strider. But if I was in your plight, I wouldn't take up with a ranger. Then who would you take up with, asked Strider. A fat innkeeper who only remembers his own name because people shouted at him all day? They cannot stay in the pony forever, and they cannot go home. They have a long road before them. Will you go with them and keep the black men off? 
Me? Leave Bree? I wouldn't do that for any money, said Mr Butterbur, looking really scared. But why can't you stay here quiet for a bit, Mr Underhill? What's all these queer things going on? Why are these men after you and where do they come from? I'd like to know. They come from Mordor, said Strider in a low voice. From Mordor, Barleyman, if that means anything to you. Save us, cried Mr Butterbur, turning pale. The name evidently was known to him. That is the worst news that has come to Bree in my time. It is, said Frodo. Are you still willing to help me? I am, said Mr Butterbur, more than ever, though I don't know what the likes of me can do against... against... he faltered. Against the shadow in the east, said Strider quietly. Not much, Barleyman, but every little helps. You can let Mr Underhill stay here tonight, as Mr Underhill, and you can forget the name of Baggins till he is far away. I'll do that, said Butterbur, but they'll find out he's here without help from me, I'm afraid. It's a pity Mr Baggins drew attention to himself this evening, to say no more. Well, we can only hope the riders won't come back yet, said Frodo. I hope not indeed, said Butterbur, but spooks or no spooks, they won't get in the pony so easy. Don't you worry till the morning. I will say no word. No man shall pass my doors while I can stand on my legs. Me and my folk will keep watch tonight, but you had best get some sleep if you can. In any case, we must be called at dawn, said Frodo. We must get off as early as possible. Breakfast at 6.30, please. Right, I'll see to the orders, said the landlord. Good night, Mr Baggins. Underhill, I should say. Good night now, bless me. Where's your Mr Brandybuck? I don't know, said Frodo with sudden anxiety. They had forgotten all about Mary and it was getting late. I'm afraid he is out. He said something about going for a breath of air. Well, you do want looking after and no mistake. Your party might be on a holiday, said Butterbur. I must go and bar the doors quick, but I'll see your friend is let in when he comes. I'd better send Nob to look for him. Good night to you all. At last, Mr Butterbur went out with another doubtful look at Strider and a shake of his head. His footsteps retreated down the passage. Well, said Strider, when are you going to open that letter? Frodo looked carefully at the seal before he broke it. It seemed certainly to be Gandalf's. Inside, written in the wizard's strong but graceful script, was the following message. Dear Frodo, bad news has reached me here. I must go off at once. You had better leave Bag End soon and get out of the Shire before the end of July at latest. I will return as soon as I can and I will follow you. If I find you are gone, leave a message for me here if you pass through Bree. You can trust the landlord Butterbur. You may meet a friend of mine on the road, a man lean and tall, by some called Strider. He knows our business and will help you. Make for Rivendell. There I hope we can meet again. If I do not come, Elrond will advise you. Yours in haste, Gandalf. Frodo read the letter to himself and then passed it to Pippin and Sam. Really, old Butterbur has made a right mess of things, he said. He deserves roasting. If I had got this at once, we might all have been safe in Rivendell by now. But what can have happened to Gandalf? He writes as if he was going to real danger. He has been doing that for many years, said Strider. Frodo turned and looked at him thoughtfully. Why didn't you tell me you were Gandalf's friend at once, he asked him. It would have saved time. Would it? Would any of you have believed me till now, said Strider? I knew nothing of this letter. For all I knew, I had to persuade you to trust me without proofs if I was to help you. In any case, I did not intend to tell you all about myself at once. I had to study you first and make sure of you. The enemy has set traps for me before now. As soon as I had made up my mind, I was ready to tell you whatever you asked. But I must admit, he added with a queer laugh, that I had hoped you would take me for my own sake. A hunted man sometimes wearies of distrust and longs for friendship, but here I have my looks against me. They are, at first sight, at any rate, laughed Pippin, with sudden relief after reading Gandalf's letter. But handsome is as handsome does, as we say in the Shire, and I dare say we shall all look much the same after lying for days in hedges and ditches. Pippin subsided, but Sam was not daunted, and he still eyed Strider dubiously. How do we know you're the Strider that Gandalf speaks about, he demanded. You never mentioned Gandalf till this letter came out. You might be a play-acting spy for all I can see, trying to get us to go with you. You might have done in the real Strider and took his clothes. What have you to say to that? That you are a stout fellow, answered Strider, but I'm afraid my only answer to you, Sam Gamgee, is that if I'd killed the real Strider, I could kill you. And I would have killed you already without so much talk if I was after the ring. He stood up and suddenly seemed to grow taller. In his eyes gleamed a light, keen and demanding. Throwing back his cloak, he laid his hand on the hilt of a sword that had hung concealed by his side. They did not dare to move. Sam sat wide-mouthed, staring at him dumbly. But I am the real Strider, fortunately, he said, looking down at them with his face softened by a sudden smile. I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and if by life or death I can save you, I will. There was a long silence. At last Frodo spoke with hesitation. I believed that you were a friend before the letter came, he said, or at least I wished to. You have frightened me several times tonight, but never in the way that servants of the enemy would, or so I imagine. I think one of his spies would, well, seem fairer and feel fouler, if you understand. Well, said Strider, with Sam's permission, we'll call that settled. Strider shall be your guide. We shall have a rough road tomorrow. Even if we are allowed to leave Bree unhindered, we can hardly hope now to leave it unnoticed. But I shall try to get us lost as soon as possible. I know one or two ways out of Breeland other than the main road. If, once we shake off the pursuit, I shall make for Weathertop. Weathertop, said Sam, what's that? 
It is a hill just north of the road, about halfway from here to Rivendell. It commands a wide view all around, and there we shall have a chance to look about us. Gandalf will make for that point too if he follows us. After Weathertop, our journey will become more difficult, and we shall have to choose between various dangers. Do you think the Black Riders have anything to do with Gandalf's absence? asked Frodo. I do not know of anything else that could have hindered him except the enemy himself, said Strider. But do not give up hope. Gandalf is greater than you Shire folk know. As a rule, you can only see his jokes and toys, but this business of ours will be his greatest task. Pippin yawned. I'm sorry, he said, but I'm dead tired. In spite of all the danger and worry, I must go to bed or sleep where I sit. Where is that silly fellow Merry? It would be the last straw if we had to go out in the dark to look for him. At that moment, they heard a door slam. Then feet came running along the passage. Merry came in with a rush, followed by Nob. He shut the door hastily and leaned against it. He was out of breath. They stared at him in alarm for a moment before he gasped. I've seen them, Frodo. I've seen the Black Riders. Black Riders, cried Frodo. Where? Here, in the village. I stayed indoors for an hour. Then, as you did not come back, I went out for a stroll. I'd come back again and was standing just outside the light of the lamp, looking at the stars. Suddenly, I shivered and felt that something terrible was creeping near. There was a sort of deeper shade amongst the shadows across the road, just beyond the edge of the lamplight. It slid away at once into the dark without a sound. There was no horse. Which way did it go? asked Strider, suddenly and sharply. Mary started, noticing the stranger for the first time. Go on, said Frodo. This is a friend of Gandalf's. I'll explain later. It seemed to make off up the road eastward, continued Mary. I tried to follow. Of course, it vanished almost at once. But I went around the corner and on as far as the last house on the road. Strider looked at Mary with wonder. You have a stout heart, he said, but it was foolish. I don't know, said Mary. Neither brave nor silly, I think. I could hardly help myself. I seemed to be drawn somehow. Anyway, I went and suddenly I heard voices by the hedge. One was muttering and the other was whispering or hissing. I couldn't hear a word that was said. I did not creep any closer because I began to tremble all over. Then I felt terrified and I turned back. I was just going to bolt home when something came behind me and I, um, fell over. I found him, sir, put in Nob. Mr. Butterbur sent me out with a lantern. I went down to the west gate and then back up towards south gate. Just near Bill Fernie's house, I thought I could see something in the road. I couldn't swear to it, but it looked to me as if two men were stooping over something, lifting it. I gave a shout, but when I got up to the spot there was no sign of them, and only Mr. Brandybuck lying by the roadside. He seemed to be asleep, and as soon as I had roused him, he got up and ran back here like a hare. I'm afraid that's true, said Mary, though I don't know what I said. I had an ugly dream, which I can't remember. I went to pieces. I don't know what came over me. I do, said Strider, the black breath. The riders must have left their horses outside and passed back through the south gate in secret. They will know all the news now, for they have visited Bill Fernie, and probably that southerner was a spy as well. Something may happen in the night before we leave Bree. What will happen, said Mary? Will they attack the inn? No, I think not, said Strider. They are not all here yet, and in any case, that is not their way. In dark and loneliness, they are strongest. They will not openly attack a house where there are lights and many people, not until they are desperate, not while all the long leagues of Eriador still lie before us. But their power is in terror, and already some in Bree are in their clutch. They will drive these wretches to some evil work, Fernie and some of the strangers, and maybe the gatekeeper too. They had words with Harry at Westgate on Monday. I was watching them. He was white and shaking when they left. We seem to have enemies all around, said Frodo. What are we to do? Stay here and do not go to your rooms. They are sure to have found out which those are. The Hobbit rooms have windows looking north and close to the ground. We will all remain together and bar this window and the door. But first, Nob and I will fetch your luggage. While Strider was gone, Frodo gave Mary a rapid account of all that had happened since supper. Mary was still reading and pondering Gandalf's letter when Strider and Nob returned. Well, masters, said Nob, I've ruffled up the clothes and put in a bolster down the middle of each bed, and I made a nice imitation of your head with a brown woollen mat. Mr. Bag uh, Underhill, sir, he added with a grin. Pippin laughed. Very lifelike, he said, but what will happen when they have penetrated the disguise? We shall see, said Strider. Let us hope to hold the fort till morning. Good night to you, said Nob, and went off to take his part in the watch on the doors. Their bags and gear they piled on the parlour floor. They pushed a low chair against the door and shut the window. Peering out, Frodo saw that the night was still clear. He then closed and barred the heavy inside shutters and drew the curtains together. Strider built up the fire and blew out all the candles. The hobbits lay down on their blankets with their feet towards the hearth, but Strider settled himself in the chair against the door. They talked for a little more, for Mary still had several questions to ask. Then they all fell silent, and one by one the hobbits dropped off to sleep. <laughs>